You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. Trying to get that last-minute Father's Day gift? Go to storyworth.com forward slash brain and get $20 off the gift of their life. I'll take 10. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, your personal empowerment coach and host of The Overwhelmed Brain. This is the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical, down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. Just remember that everything I talk about on this show should not be mistaken for actual medical advice or treatment and is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult your physician before making any changes to your medical treatment. And also remember that what you'll find here is an increase in your emotional intelligence, a strengthening of your self-worth and self-esteem, the motivation to be your authentic self, and the forward momentum to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. All right, one of the first things I want to talk about is having to do with uh, your family in the sense that when you grow up, get out of the house, go on your own, and you're happy to be away from them. (laughs) Not everybody, but some people uh, are happy to be away from dysfunctional family members, from toxic family members. You know, I um, spent a long time away from my family because of one single toxic family member. I pretty much isolated myself from my entire family because of one person. And I I was always at least a thousand miles away from my entire family. I still am today, unfortunately. But I do go back and visit now, and I never see, well, that's not true. I did see this one toxic family member uh, one of the times I visited, And um, probably the time I've talked about on the air where he came to my mom's house and I was there and I had an opportunity to let him in or let him in or not. So I've talked about that on many episodes. If um, you want to know more about that, just go ahead and listen to other episodes or write to me and I'll tell you the story (laughs) or I'll tell you which episode to listen to. Uh, Otherwise, um, I've stayed away from my family for a long time, for many, many years because of one person. You know, I also wanted to explore, you know, the world or at least my role in the world and learn about myself and, you know, figure out where I wanted to live and who I wanted to be with. I did all those adult things that we sometimes do, except for the having kids part. I never did the having kids part, which is pretty interesting. It gives me a different perspective as an adult without kids. And I also have the perspective uh, of an adult with kids because my girlfriend has a kid and I've learned a lot about that. And, you know, my sisters and brothers have kids, but to actually be a parent, I've not experienced. So, you know, my girlfriend believes in past lives and reincarnation. So I'll probably come back and have lots of kids. (laughs) I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, um, the topic I want to talk about is getting back to family that has been toxic or dysfunctional. For me, it was one person For you, it may be no one or it may be almost everyone. I got a letter from someone I'll call um, Marsha. And I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but um, she goes on to say that, you know, she was born on this island and she got away from the island. There's something she's always wanted to do is get away from this island, get away from her family and uh, get a job and just live a, a life away from them. But then later on in life, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years later, She feels completely alienated and she doesn't have any friends. She doesn't have any, uh, she doesn't have a boyfriend. And now she is feeling lonely. She's feeling down and she's thinking, you know, maybe I should go back to this island and rekindle my relationship and 
figure out where what my role is in the family again and can I accept them? Will they accept me? I've done work on myself. I'm a different person. I'm not the person they want me to be because if I was, I would still be there and I would be enabling their bad behavior. This is some of my words too. So <laughs> it's not all her saying this. I'm just kind of putting words in her mouth because that's how I see it. It's like if I go back to family into a dysfunctional situation and I act the same as I did when I was there, then I am essentially enabling their bad behavior. And this is something I say in uh, dysfunctional relationships too, is that if you stay with someone who does bad behavior and they're not accountable for it, you're essentially enabling their bad behavior, causing them to do it more. That sounds kind of strange, but hear me out. This really uh, goes along the lines of emotional, emotionally abusive relationships where you feel guilty leaving someone uh, that's emotionally abusing you. If you feel guilty leaving someone emotionally abusing you, then by you staying and enabling their dysfunction, their toxicity, you are helping them stay unhealthy. So there's a deeper seed to that that we could talk about right now, but I've talked about it very recently in other episodes. Just go ahead and listen to the episodes on emotional abuse and you'll understand where I'm going there. But when it comes to family, uh, there's a very similar aspect of that is that if you show up as the person you've always been and as the person they've always known you to be, then you will continue their bad, dysfunctional, slash toxic, slash whatever behavior, even though you don't want it. Even though you are hoping they've changed so you can come back and uh, live a happier life with them. Get along wonderfully. The fact of the matter is that unless people go on a uh, self-empowering journey and start emotionally evolving and start really understanding themselves and where their problems lie and taking responsibility for the challenges that happen to them in life and how they react to those challenges. Unless they go on that trek, they're not going to change. They might, but it's best for you to develop the belief that they're not going to change. Now, if one family member calls you up and says, Hey, I've been listening to this overwhelmed brain guy <laughs> and I realized some things about myself and wow, you know, I'm sorry. I, I realized that I've been not treating you well. If that happens or if they're seeing a therapist or, you know, going to self-help seminars and they're really learning about themselves and they share that with you, then there is a great chance that this person might not be toxic anymore. In fact, there's a greater chance that you'll be able to develop a good relationship with them if you yourself have gone on a personal growth journey and someone else has as well and they're still on it. It's another thing is that if they've gone through the journey and they're great now and everything's perfect, you just got to be careful. (laughs) Some people uh, can get to a point where everything's great in my life and I'm no longer toxic and I realize I was. Uh, I'm no longer emotionally abusive or abusive in general, and I realize I was. There's realizations about their past that they usually come to when they've gone gone through any type of self-help journey. Just like you yourself have probably realized there are things that you've done that maybe you wish you had done differently or you wish you had been a different person back then, but now you're learning to be a different person. You're healing and growing and learning and all that. You can go through a lot of personal growth and feel like, there, I'm done. (laughs) I've made it. I've gotten to a point where nothing triggers me and I can see the world through very clear lenses and I have a positive perspective and a positive outlook. Therefore, I'm healed and I'm fixed. You can get to that point. I don't believe really anyone's at that point. I mean, you you get as close as you can get. Um, But usually there's a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then if there's not a little bit more, then you you might be missing something. I'm not saying you couldn't live the rest of your life like that. It wouldn't be fine. That, that, that can happen. You can reach a level of growth and healing in yourself where, hey, I really have nothing more to work on. This is great. That's my goal. <laughs> my goal, especially with you, you listening. I want you to get to a point where you no longer need a show like this, where you no longer need advice. I don't know if it's possible. 
I still look for advice for the stuff that I go through. I try to figure it out, and if I can, I work on it, figure it out, work on it, heal from it. Uh, and then an emotional trigger comes out of nowhere, and I go, what? <laughs> That's still in there? Oh, I got to work on it. So I, I'm always seeking more. It's like a coach always needs a coach, always needs a coach. And um, as long as you are still seeking answers for yourself or for others, then you are always learning. If you get to a point where you close your mind and you say, I've learned enough, then I have a feeling that's a little bit of ego kicking in and saying, there's no need to learn more. You know enough. You can heal the world like this. Or you don't need to know anymore because you're perfect the way you are. Like I said, you can go the rest of your life like that and you might have a great life. But at the same time, uh, as soon as you make your mind up about something, uh, it usually closes. So I just want you to be careful with that and also be careful of people like that. Not that they're bad or wrong. You just want to be aware that if somebody says, oh no, I've gone through all my personal growth and I know enough. I know everything I need to know and I'm feeling great. I'm a little suspect when that happens, but that doesn't mean it's not true. You never know what people have picked up over the years and they may never know until they're triggered one day. You know, you could be like 72 years old, you've lived a great life and nothing really has triggered you and you've healed from a lot. And then suddenly somebody says something that really upsets you. And you don't even know why you've gotten so upset. You just haven't had that trigger before. So suddenly it's a trigger and now you've got to deal with it. So that's all I'm saying is that often personal growth and development is never done. And I remember my when I was married, my wife said, When does this stop? <laughs> when does personal growth stop? I'm sick of all these lessons. And I was like, I'm so sorry, I don't know if it ever does. And she didn't like that answer. And uh, she was sick of doing it. But I really think that was a good thing that she went through that. I, I believe sometimes you have to hit that breakdown, that bottom of the barrel feeling, that when does this end feeling in order to get to the next level of personal growth and development, in order to get to the next level of emotional evolution. You have to break through your preconceived notions of when you're done. You have to break through your own belief structure. Like you blow the top off your belief structure and suddenly you're at a whole new level of being. I call that enlightenment. When you break through a belief structure that you have and suddenly you're at a, at a whole new level and you have all new ideas and all new realizations, and you're now on a different road. You're going in the same direction, always toward more enlightenment, but it's a different path now because what used to bother you in the past doesn't anymore. And my real world example of that is when my car broke down in the desert and I reached the height of panic and anxiety, thinking that I was going to lose my car and all my stuff in my car. And um, after many hours of going back and forth on the phone, at the time I was married, so I was going back and forth with my wife, uh, we came to the conclusion that I was going to lose my car and my stuff. And that's when my panic just blew up. <laughs> and uh, I reached that breakdown. My beliefs and my reality did not include this as an option. But when it became an option and I had no choice, it blew out the barriers of what I believed would be true in my life and suddenly I was at a whole new level of enlightenment because I was able to let go of my car and all my stuff. And I, and from that point on I became peaceful with being a minimalist, with being with letting things go easily. I had such a strong attachment to things and it was easy to let them go after that point because I finally broke through a belief system, um, a structure that I created about my life and how I wanted it to be. As soon as that opens up for you and you break through it, you discover a whole new reality that you never believed you would be a part of, that you could live. And that's what my life has been since then. And other things like that have happened, but not to that grand scale where I was able to let go of attachments. That was amazing to me. And it still touches me deep 
in my heart when I think about that time because I was at the highest level of anxiety and panic that I've ever experienced. And suddenly I was at the most peaceful place in my life ever. <laughs> right a minute later, <laughs> right after the top blew off on my structure of reality. So that can happen to people. And that's why it's important to keep an open mind that um, you always have more learning and growth to do. It may not be true, but I think it's good to err on the side of uh, caution on there in that respect, because you never know what next lesson there is. But let me get back to Marsha, who wrote to me and said, you know, I, I'm afraid to go back to family, but I want to because I'm lonely where I am. She's in a different country, away from the island that she grew up on. And um, she said one thing that I'm going to read right now, and it's this. Uh, my need for a sense of belonging and family is becoming huge and is overriding anything else. However, deep in my heart, I feel that I, even if I go back to my family, it'll just be a temporary solution. It's a paradox that I always feel so much homesick, but at the same time, I can't imagine my future on the island. This confusion and dilemma burn my mind constantly. I think about all the consequences that my decisions would bring. My fear is that I'm going to fail anyway. I'm stuck and absorbed by all this overthinking. Well, let me tell you, Marsha, uh, my solution to overthinking is doing what I believe I'm going to fail at and see if I was right or wrong. Re I mean, it's that simple and that difficult <laughs> at the same time, meaning Maybe you have to move back to find out if your belief of failure is true. It may be. But right now you're experiencing a place of non-closure. There's unfinished business or you're lonely and you believe that your family can help uh, fulfill you in some way. So you don't feel so lonely or maybe certain members of your family. And you may be right, but you may be wrong. But if you don't try it, You'll never know if you're right or wrong, and you will always be in stagnation, and you'll always be lonely. You'll always feel what you're feeling now. So my solution to this particular thing is you go and you experience it and find out if it's a failure or not. One thing, if it's a failure, then you won't feel like you need to go back to them. That feeling will go away. It'll dissipate. Now, not all of it. I mean, there may still be feelings inside of you that you want family, you want closeness, you want connection with people. And this is the second part of my answer to you. It's this. Can you move back and be secure in yourself enough so that when people show up with their toxic thoughts and behavior, that you know what's acceptable to you and what's not, and you're able to honor yourself no matter what? If you're able to show up and honor yourself no matter what, no matter what kind of behavior comes your way, then what's going to happen is that your family is going to have to get used to the new you instead of you getting used to being the old you around family. And that's a vital difference because you can't really be affected by people if you show up being secure in yourself, knowing what's right for you. You can be affected by people, but overall, you can put a stop to it. You can put a line in the sand and say, no, you can't cross this line. I like who I've become. I like who I am. And I want to keep this about me. I want to hold on to this person that I've become. I've learned a lot about myself. Now, you may not be able to do that. You may show up and know that you're going to buckle under the pressure. And when they show up being who they've always been, uh, that may be too much for you. You may not be able to handle it, which means you probably need to do some more inner work before you go there. You know, what that means, I don't know, whatever it is for you. But I do know that you get to a point in life where you're either going to continue showing up as you've always been, where people can take advantage of you, walk on you, and uh, treat you in a way that is not healthy for you, or them, really, and that means you standing up for yourself, you being secure in yourself, you being confident in who you are, or you can choose to enable their behavior. You can choose to react negatively when they try to incite a reaction from you, when they try to trigger you, when they try to push your buttons, 
They know what buttons to push. They're going to try. <laughs> At least some of them are going to try pushing those buttons. And you can either show up and try to defend yourself and get mad. Or you can, you know, say, huh, you're, you're trying to push my buttons. I can see what you're doing. I can see it. You know, that, that's a different enlightened perspective. Oh, I see what you're doing. You're trying to push my buttons. Okay. Well, it doesn't work on me anymore. I see what you're trying to do. What? That doesn't make you angry? It would have in the past, but, you know, I've, I've grown beyond that. I can see that you haven't. <laughs> you may not say that, but it's the, uh, the energy inside yourself, the thought processes that, that go on. You can either allow behavior and let it bother you, or you can see the behavior for what it, for what it is, toxic, and go, whoa, I don't want that behavior in my life. And you can choose to step out of a conversation still confident in who you are and what you want for yourself, or you can stay in a conversation and get all defensive or uh, try to placate and make things nice and, you know, be maybe a person that you used to be, or maybe you still are, I don't know. But it does take uh, a stronger sense of you. It takes a stronger sense of self and knowing that you are going to stand up for yourself if you need to, because that might mean pissing some people off. That might mean pissing people off that you love or want to love you. Because when you stand up for yourself and you draw that line, the people who are used to crossing it won't like you as much or at all because you're not allowing them to mistreat you. Imagine going through life allowing people to mistreat you. You probably don't have to imagine it. If you're one of the listeners of this show, just like uh, something I did all my life, I'm a people pleaser. I allowed people to walk all over me. You may have done the same thing. You may have allowed people to mistreat you in your life. If not once, then many times or all the time. That's why it's so important to develop this strong sense of self. I just had an episode on this. Developing your sense of self. Discovering your sense of self. Who are you? Because once you know who you are, you can step into that and walk forward as that person and you protect that person. That's who you protect. Now I know who I am. Nothing bad gets through. Nothing toxic gets through. Because I will stand up as soon as I sense it. You may or may not be there. I don't know. So I don't know if you should move back or not. Maybe you should visit. I don't know. Maybe you should get on uh, Facebook and talk with them. I don't know. Maybe you can stick your toe in the water and find out what happens when you do get triggered. Maybe you should connect with certain people. I don't know. I do know that if you stay and you always wonder what could have been, you'll never know and you'll always have that stagnant, unfinished feeling, that open loop that never closes, that you feel like there's just something I need to find out and I haven't found out, but I think I'm going to fail anyway. So if I don't do anything, I feel like a failure, but if I do something, I might fail anyway. My thought is just to do it and find out if you fail. Because if, at least if you fail, then you'll know. If you don't try it and you don't fail or you don't succeed, then you'll never know and you're back to square one, never getting anywhere and always feeling lonely and down and whatever you feel. So um, the last thing you said about um, being absorbed by all this overthinking, the solution to overthinking is to do the thing that you're thinking about. Well, I'm not sure if I should move to another country or I should move back to an island or I should go see this new guy that I'm dating over in South America. I don't know. I just don't know what to do. Do it and then create a process of elimination. I mean, of course you have to have the funds and the resources and the means, but you do what you can to find out if what you're going to do is going to work. Because contemplation creates overthinking contemplation and pondering and wondering and hoping and having faith and and just waiting for things to work out for you it causes overthinking because you you never know the answer how do you get the answer you do it and find out and yes you might fail and failing is the success of new knowledge so go ahead and fail to get the success of new knowledge so that you are not stuck with unfinished business because that's really what's prevalent. You want to get rid of this unfinished business feeling. This openness. This cliffhanger. What happens next? What happens next? What should I do next? That's what I want from you, Marsha. I hope that helps. 
We'll be right back with Ask Paul right after this. Hey, you didn't forget Father's Day, did you? Well, if you know of any father, hey, it doesn't have to be your father. (laughs) I know my girlfriend's father, and I know her mother. In fact, I got her this gift I'm about to talk about. It's called StoryWorth. StoryWorth is a service that you gift to someone, and what they do is send a question a week to the person you gift it to so that they can answer it and tell the story of their life. It sounds harder than it is, but really... What they're doing is uh, just asking simple questions like, uh, how was life for you when you were 12? What were your friends like? What movies were you watching? What were you watching on TV? Little things like that that really open up some memories. Because you know how it works. You know, you think of a movie that you watched and then you think of who you watched it with. And then you think of the, the rest of the night and what you did after that. And that leads to another associated memory of what else you did with that friend and what else you did for the rest of the week. Or maybe you went to summer camp or maybe you had the best year in school or the worst year (laughs) in school. And all of these memories come up as you write this out. And, you know, I gave this gift already to two people, my sister and my girlfriend's mom. And my sister has done a lot of these uh, questions so far. So she's getting all the content or a book that's going to be sent to her to sit on her coffee table or her dining room table for her family to look at and see what she wrote so that even when I come over and visit her, I can see what she wrote about me and maybe the pictures that she uploaded. And it's all in this beautiful keepsake hardcover book. I want you to get it. I want you to get it for either your father, someone else's father, because you know, as of this airing, it is Father's Day. But even if you're not into that, into the Father's Day thing, or you don't know a father that might want this, get it for someone that you care about and you want to know more about, or that you know would like to share their story with their family, or just likes talking about their own history. It's a really cool gift. I highly recommend it. Go to storyworth.com forward slash brain, and you'll get $20 off your subscription. That's storyworth.com forward slash brain and give someone the gift of their life. Welcome back to the Ask Paul segment. I'm going to read you an email that I received. Actually, momentarily, because I want to mention something that I forgot to mention in the last segment about Marsha's question which is, should I rekindle this relationship with my family? Uh, And, you know, how is that going to work out and stuff? And one of the things I forgot to mention is that if and when you do rekindle with people that were once dysfunctional or toxic in your life, the very first interaction is the most important one. So if you haven't seen your sister or your mom or your brother and they were at once dysfunctional or toxic to you, when you interact with them for the first time after a long time, it will most likely define how your relationship goes from that point on. And that is so vital. No matter who it is in your life that you are reconnecting with, you need to establish who you are, what you stand for, what you will accept, what you won't accept, so that going forward, They know what to expect from you. If you aren't able to establish that in the first interaction, uh, two things are going to happen. One, you'll probably get upset and harbor resentment or anger because they're still mistreating you and they just don't understand. And number two, they're still going to mistreat you. And then when you do get upset and finally say something, they're going to be like, what's the problem? You're you're crazy. I I don't understand what's wrong with you. On our first day, you were great, but now you're being a jerk. And it's because now suddenly you're going to stand up for yourself, honor yourself, and they're like, who are you? Because you didn't show up like that on the first day. That's why it's important to be authentic. Show up as the person you want to be. Show up as the person you want to be treated like. And um, to top it off, always honor yourself 
with the sentiment of, I love you, but this is not acceptable. I love you and I want to continue our relationship as long as you do, don't do this behavior. I think it's important to come at it that way so that you are always exuding that, that loving kindness, that loving, hey, I still want you in my life, but I can't take that behavior. So be yourself, the person you want to be today, not the person they want you to be, unless that's what you like. And uh, that will help establish and define who you are to them from that point on. I chose to do this. I've, I've done everything I teach, almost everything I teach. <laughs> I've chosen to do this with my family. I show up as the person I want to be treated as. And um, they've all accepted me, except maybe, maybe one. <laughs> she didn't like that I wouldn't uh, give in to her uh, asking something of me that I felt uncomfortable doing. So uh, I don't know if she really wants to communicate with me anymore. Uh, but I still love her. I still welcome her in my life. I still accept her for everything she is and everything she does. It's just, you know, that's her life. But she asked something of me that made me uncomfortable and I did not allow it in my life. And I approached her in the sense of, I love you and this is the relationship I want to have with you, not the one that you want to have. Not in that way. Not with this other thing that I'm talking about that I'll keep private. <laughs> So uh, the idea is just to approach them with love, with kindness, and stand up for yourself. And when I say stand up, I just mean honor yourself if you have to. If someone wants to cross the line, if someone is uh, violating one of your boundaries, you can take a step back and go, whoa, I love you, but don't do that. I love you, but that's not acceptable to me. You may not say those exact words, but that sentiment is always there. And it shows that you're not just some bitter person that has <laughs> that yet they haven't seen in you know 20 years it shows that hey i've i've been doing a lot of personal growth and now i know what's right for me and this is who i am and you'll find that the people that love and support you the most want you to honor yourself and they will want you to be happy they will support your happiness they will support you supporting yourself they will support you honoring yourself they will honor you honoring yourself. That's powerful. When you have friends or family like that, that to me is truly as close to unconditional love as you can get. I support you supporting yourself. Hey, you don't want that in your life? Hey, I support that too. I want it in my life, but you don't want it in your life? And then I'll keep it away from you. You know, there are people that may do things and say things that you don't prefer to have in your life. And if they do it for themselves or in their own lives, that's fine. I mean, you can be okay with that or not. It's totally up to you. But if they don't feel like you are preventing them from living their life and you don't want that behavior in your life and they say, oh, okay, you don't want me to do that around you? No problem. That's supporting you. That's honoring you. That's the direction I go with that. So let's get to a letter that uh, came in from someone called Joshua. He said, I can use his real name. So this is Joshua really is Joshua. <laughs> he says, thank you for checking in with me. Uh, we had communicated in email. Uh, I appreciate that. Things are getting better. I've been standing up for myself in the moment more. I've been talking to my girlfriend about her manipulation and guilt trips that she learned from her mom, and she's been working on it, and listening to your show now too. And I confronted my dad about his drinking, and he still drinks, but he's been trying to keep it away from me. I still get tested by some people who don't know the new me, and it's challenging to stay the new me sometimes, especially to those that I used to cower down to, like my brother, but I've been doing it, and my stress levels feel like they're going down. I've even worked up the courage to get my motorcycle license, which I've been wanting to do for a long time, but was too scared. I'm really liking who I'm becoming, thanks to your show. I refer to everyone I can. I want to join the patron program, but I need to find a house by next month or I'm stuck in a year lease in an apartment that doesn't fix things when they are broken and I can hear the neighbors. <laughs> I don't think I've told you my whole story, but I would like to when I get the time. You can share it and use my name if you'd like. I think it's so awesome how you help people and I try to help give back using the Amazon link. Well, okay, Joshua, thank you so much for this message. And uh, there's a couple of reasons I read this. 
And one of them was not because you were advertising everything I advertise at the end of the show. <laughs> like the patron program and the Amazon link. Thank you for those mentions. I appreciate that. And thank you for using the Amazon link. Absolutely. Very helpful. It is a great way to give back. Um, but the real reason I read this email is because it's very much in line with what I just talked about. And it shows what happens when you show up as you. It shows what happens when you are authentically you. When you decide to show up in the world more and more as the person that you want to be. And I know it's hard. I know I can just say, hey, just show up as yourself and be yourself and show people where the line is. And if they cross it, speak up for yourself. I know it's easy for me, for me to say that. And a lot of it does involve taking little leaps of faith and finding out what happens when you do. Like I said, I've done this stuff myself. I've taken leaps of faith and found out 100% of the time, I'm not saying it's going to happen this way for you, but 100% of the time, what I thought was going to happen, a bad outcome, didn't. It was always a good outcome. It was a scary outcome. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen when I honored myself and said what was on my mind, but I did it. And what happened is that I got to be authentic and speak my mind and especially not hold anything in, not repress anything. You've heard me talk about depression before, right? When you don't express, you suppress your thoughts, which represses your emotions, which leads to depression. Depression is like a non-emotional state. You're just down and out and you can't really feel anything. At least that was my experience with depression. And you have no motivation, and you just don't care, or you do care, but you can't do anything about it. It's really a, a nasty state to be in, and it's hard to get out. And if you haven't heard me talk about how I got out of depression, it's saying the hard things that I didn't want to say, that I chose to repress. Over time in my life, I chose to hold back and not express the things that were on my mind especially negative things. If I was angry, I would hold that in. If I was sad, I would hold that in too. Anything negative because I didn't want to show people my vulnerable side. Or if I didn't want to show people my anger because I didn't want to be confrontational. So I held it in and I kept stuffing it down. And that turns into depression. One of the ways out of depression is to start saying the hard stuff. When I admitted the hatred toward my stepfather, something that was very hard for me to say because I didn't even know it was in there, suddenly the next day I felt lighter, a lightness that I had not felt before. And I realized, whoa, that's kind of cool. That actually feels better. That feels like the opposite of depression. And I started digging in more and going, what else is in there? What else am I angry at? Who else do I hate? Who do I want? And I, this is a weird one. Who do I want to kill? Though that thought came up, not that I wanted to, but maybe that anger was in there. Uh, what was I sad about? Who was I still mad at? All these thoughts that I just explored. And I also bypassed my um, ethical and morality filters. If I can bypass my ethics and mo my morals in my thoughts, then I can go to extremes. Who do I want to cut the brake line on their car? <laughs> Again, this is all your imagination, just thinking to find out what's in there. Oh, I'm still mad at that guy that dated my sister that stole all my parents' land. And I think about that stuff. I just thought about that today with a client. I'm like, let me go back in time. What do I think about that? <laughs> and, and I came up with the words, that guy's a jerk. So I'm like, oh, I still have that in there? Hmm, I got to look at that. But that's what's in there. You got You have people in your life that have triggered you in some way and either you were able to process and release the trigger by expressing in some way or just healing through it in some way or maybe you suppressed the thoughts repressed the emotions and added to a depression inside of you maybe you'll have to look within and figure out what's still there and that's kind of a, a way to do it when you think of people in your past how do i feel about that person if your ethics and morals kick in and your politeness kicks in and goes, well, I shouldn't be mad at him. Whenever you say I shouldn't <laughs> do something, you should probably do it. Well, I should be mad at him. What, what would happen if I was mad at him? 
And then you can go through the thought process that you need to go through to bring up that emotion and maybe even process it, heal from it, release, maybe write a, a virtual letter that you never send to the person. You son of a, I can't believe you did this and on and on and on. And maybe you'll get something out. Maybe you'll feel a little lighter if you do that. Anyway, let me get back to Joshua's letter. Joshua, thank you. I wanted to share this because this is a place that I want to see more people get to. Because one of the things that you said is, I used to cower down to family members. But as you've been honoring yourself, your stress levels feel like they're going down. This is what happens. You start showing up as the person you want to be. You start showing others who you want to be and how you want to be treated. And they have no choice but to treat you that way or, and I don't mean this literally, get out of your way. <laughs> I don't mean it that way necessarily, but either treat me this way, treat me with respect and kindness and uh, honor me, honoring myself. Or if you don't, then maybe our relationship isn't as important to you. I don't know. But what you're doing, Joshua, is you're finding out that as you honor yourself, you're starting to get more of what you want in life. You're starting to uh, create the reality that you want instead of fear the reality that is. It's really strange, but as you honor yourself more and more, you get more of what you want in life. It's just the way it works because you're clear. You're clear that this is what I'll accept and this is what I won't accept. This is what's right for me and that's not right for me. That's toxic for me. And you'll remove these toxic elements and suddenly your stress levels do go down. Your life feels better. So thank you again, Joshua. I wanted to share that with the world because what you're saying is so important and a place that absolutely you can get to if you start honoring yourself. Again, it's not easy. You're going to have resistance from other people. The people that have been mistreating you all this time will want you to stay where you are so that you don't honor yourself and you honor them dishonoring you. That's no fun. I don't want you to be there. I want you to honor yourself and show that you won't take any less from anyone else. doesn't mean you show up to the world as a jerk. You show up as, I love you, and this is what I'll accept in my life, and this is what I won't accept in my life. So thanks again, Joshua. So when we come back, I'm going to read you one more letter that's not really a question. It's more of a comment, but there's a lesson in there, just like this one from Joshua. Be right back. All right, I said I'm going to read one more letter, and this is from Haley. And Haley said, you can use my real name. Who are all these people letting me use their real name? <laughs> Haley uh, signed her letter. She goes, I don't mind you using my real name, although as I write this, I'm wondering what name you'd come up with for me. Well, Haley, if I was going to make up a name, I'd probably use Jan. <laughs> and uh, I used Marsha in the last segment, so I think Marsha, Jan... And if I read another letter, it would probably be Cindy. And if you've ever seen the Brady Bunch, you probably know the direction I'm going with that. <laughs> so Jan, I mean Haley, uh, here's your letter. She writes, I want to thank you for your podcast and being so frank and to the point. I only started listening a few days ago and already you've taught me so much about myself. And this letter is about a month old, so she's probably been listening a little longer. Uh, the one that stuck out for me, the one that made me think, dang... And I must write to you and thank you for the, your insight was about emotionally needy people and also the, the one about emotionally abusive relationships. My partner and I have been going through so many issues to the point that we were both wondering if this was right for us. But at the same time, we both want this to work between us. We have talked and he has moved out and tried to change the situation we were both in, hoping to alleviate the intensity and give us both the space that we need to do the personal work and growth that we were each in the middle of when we met. However, the excitement of a new relationship sent us both off track and spiraling back to old destructive ways without realizing. I feel though now, having found your podcast along with a new beginning for my relationship, that we can actually work through this. I can recognize that I'm an emotionally needy person and he needs his space. I can recognize signs of emotional abuse from him and myself. I'm not going to pretend he's the only one to blame. 
but more importantly, challenge that behavior, especially my behavior and thinking patterns. I feel like I have equally contributed to this breakdown in our relationship with my negative thinking and emotional neediness. But now realizing this, I can focus back on turning myself and my attitude around in order to secure a better foundation for me and my relationships, not just with my partner, but with everyone. Thank you again for your podcast. The frankness you approach each issue with, the practical tools and advice that you provide in challenging each issue, and the way you relate everything back to your personal experience, how you overcame, tackled, and moved past the issue. Kindest regards and blessings. Haley. Haley, thank you so much. I appreciate that. It always makes me feel good to hear these kinds of success stories, even though it's a success work in process. I know you're going to get there. And I wanted to read this, not because I'm uh, stroking my own ego today. (laughs) I want to read this to give people, just like the last letter, to give people hope, to help them understand that as you discover things about yourself, If you choose to follow through and realize that, hey, I have a responsibility here. It's not only up to the other person to change. It's up to me to look inward and realize what I'm doing too. What am I doing? What is my role? What is my responsibility in this relationship? And I tell you what, even when you are the quote victim of emotional abuse, of being mistreated, of dysfunction of any kind, you're still in the equation to facilitate it and make it happen. Doesn't mean you're the cause, but you are part of the equation. And when you're part of the equation, you are part of the problem. I hate to say that because there are real victims and there are real uh, victims of abuse, emotionally and physically and even worse. There are people that are suffering. There are people that Uh, can't get out of the relationship because of X, Y, Z. I feel your pain. I know what you're going through. I know that you feel like there are no options and there's nothing you can do. So I'm not saying that it's your fault. I'm saying that you just have to be aware that you being in the situation means it probably won't stop. And that's important. So if we're going to learn a lesson from Haley's letter or from any person's letter that ever writes in, that when you decide to take responsibility for your role in the relationship, for your role in any dysfunction at all that you're a part of, even if you're working for a crooked boss and he or she wants you to do unethical things and you feel really bad about doing it, but you do it because you know you'll get fired or you you won't get your raise or whatever. You're being told to do things at gunpoint when in reality you can leave, you just don't like the consequences of leaving. So regardless of the reason you don't leave a bad situation, you still have to look at it and go, what is my role in this? If it's a job, you can go, well, My role is that I'm doing the things that are against my values, that are against my morals. I'm doing these things. I may not like it, but I feel like I'm forced to do these things. So I am playing a role. So I am responsible for that. I feel like I have no choice, but I still take responsibility for it. There's always a choice, but a lot of the times we don't take the choice because we don't like the consequences of that choice. Like the person leaving an abusive relationship doesn't like the consequence of the possibility that that other person would chase them down or find them or threaten them or do something worse. We don't like those consequences, so we don't take the chance. But we do have to take responsibility for where we are and what we choose to do. If you are in a relationship with dysfunction, like Haley said, you know, we we had to split up and then we came together again and, and now we're having the same dysfunction as before. She's taking responsibility for it. And it sounds like her other half is taking responsibility too. And as long as they're aware of it and they're working on it, then there's a good chance that things could go well. Now, I will say this, Haley. When you're together, it's usually harder to heal. It's usually harder to get through your stuff because now you're being triggered by that person 
and you want to honor yourself and they want to honor themselves. And now you have this conflict because your thoughts include them that are influenced by them. And there's not much you can do for yourself because now you got to cater to them. There's, there's all kinds of complex variables there. It can work, but you do need your own space every now and then. You do need some balance in your own life for you. You do need your own quiet time, just like your partner may need their own space and their own quiet time. So there's some balancing that goes on in each of your lives so that you can meet after the balance. It's hard to find balance when you're unbalanced and then you get together. It's hard to find healing when you're unhealed and you both get together as an unhealed couple because there's just way too many triggers. And one trigger activates your trigger, activates his trigger, activates so on and so forth, back and forth. That's tough. That's tough to get out of. And you don't even know what your thoughts are without that person in your life. This is like uh, something I did in my relationship, my first long-term relationship. My girlfriend was like, I'm feeling down. I'm, I don't know why I'm feeling down. And I was like, maybe you just need to take a break. You work a lot. I'm, a, I'm around you all the time. I even knew how uh, needy I was back then, but I, I didn't want to change that about me. But I also knew that she probably needed a break from me and everything else. So I gave her like, uh, I don't know, two or three days in a hotel a few hours away in a nice city. And I was like, here, do this. And she's like, really? And I'm like, yes. And she did that. She went away for a couple of days and she came back. She was ready to come back. She goes, oh, wow, I, I needed that break. That was nice. And that gave her a chance to think about her life without me in it. You know, it sounds risky, doesn't it? Go away without me. Think of life without me. And she was able to do that better when I wasn't around. And I think that helped. Overall, long term, I still had issues in the relationship. There was uh, emotional abuse going on. There was other things going on. And it eventually ended. But um, that component of what happened is something I take with me today. I realized that Hey, if my girlfriend's had too much of me, then I'll leave for the day. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of weird to think about that. But if you see this in your partner, just like you're saying, Haley, you know, I know I'm emotionally needy and I know he needs his space. Hey, you know what? I'm going to give him the day off. I'm going to leave or he's going to leave and I'll be okay with it. You know, whatever you arrange, that shows that you're willing to work on yourself and get through this. So anyway, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to say is that it's important to notice these things about yourself. It's important to realize that you do have issues, even when all the issues look like they're on the other side, because you wouldn't be with someone with this many issues if you didn't have some issues. <laughs> Am I 100% right about every circumstance? Maybe there are exceptions there, but typically people with issues attract people with issues. Uh, and people who stay with people with a lot of issues can also be in either the enabling space or they have so many issues themselves, but they blame the other person uh, for many things that go on in the relationship or everything that goes on in the relationship that that dysfunctional feedback machine just kicks in and pretty soon it's one big mess and you don't know who's at fault, who's at blame, who's at cause, who's at effect. And that's why sometimes it's important to do what you did, separate for a while. Maybe you got back together too soon. We'll see. You'll have to give me an update. <laughs> so let me know, Haley. Thank you so much once again. And thanks for listening to another show. We'll be right back. My final words right after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank StoryWorth for allowing us to give a very unique gift to someone very unique in our lives. Go to storyworth.com forward slash brain and use the code word brain to get $20 off your subscription today. Give the gift that lasts for generations. And I want you to think of another gift, The Overwhelmed Brain book. It's the A to Z of self-empowerment. I know you know someone who needs this. <laughs> 
So go to your local bookstore or go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble and get The Overwhelmed Brain, Personal Growth for Critical Thinkers and help your friends and family to find their empowerment too. And I want to thank the TOB patron members. The patron membership site is really a way to support the show, but I also throw in bonuses like extra episodes and video training and even email coaching. So if you're interested in supporting the show, you want to give back, go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And of course, you can always give back using the Amazon link at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. I mentioned it earlier. You heard it already. <laughs> For those of you using the Amazon link, it's helpful. Thank you so much. It's keeping the show going. So whether you're a patron or not, or you're using the Amazon link or not, even just listening, you're making the world a better place. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> anyway, thank you to all of you. And uh, finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And I want to end the show today with a quick comment about uh, breaking up. When you break up, when you get a divorce, when someone leaves you, and especially if you don't want it, if you don't want the breakup, if you don't want the relationship to end, there's a certain feeling that you have, that uh, feeling of attachment that you still have to the person. Like I had someone write to me recently and say, you know, it's only been two weeks, but, um, you know, I, I feel bad about the last conversation that we had, so I want to apologize. I want to call up and apologize, but my friends are telling me, no, it's too soon. Don't call and apologize. And um, I was thinking, okay, well, apologizing for a conversation that you had for something that you feel like maybe you didn't say it the right way or it came off the wrong way, uh, that's not a bad thing. Maybe I want to say that I miss our friendship too. And now we're talking about something that might be getting a little too close a little too soon. So he asked me, you know, is it too soon? Should I just avoid contact altogether? Is this an unhealthy thing to do? Is this good for our friendship? You know, uh, how should I approach this? What should I do? And my thought on this is that I want you to think about how you felt the day after the breakup, the day after you left someone or they left you. And that feeling is either going to be one of I'm attached and I want to keep it or it's going to be I'm finally free of this and I need to move on now. Now, there's also a third category. Uh, I still love that person. I'm still attached, but it's unhealthy for me. Or there are other reasons too. But the main ones, the main feelings you'll get is I'm so attached and I want it back. Or I'm not attached and I want to move on. So my, I, my thought is that if you have an attachment still and you want it back, then it's a bad idea to try to contact them. Uh, only in the sense that it will only... Uh, continue to make you feel um, hurt. So if you're already feeling hurt that you don't have a good relationship with the person that left you, then it's probably no, not a good idea to contact them while you're still feeling the same way you felt the day after you guys broke up or whatever. So if you do have this strong attachment and you want them back, then contacting them might be your your subconscious trying to find a covert way to get in touch with them in hopes that they will hear your voice and then fall back in love with you and come back to you. I'm not saying that couldn't happen, but it's not a good idea to do that because what's going to happen, let's just say that does happen. Let's just say that you one of you calls the other and you start talking and there's apologies and there's good feelings about the past and you talk about your history and maybe we can make it better this time. If enough time hasn't passed and enough healing hasn't taken place and you're both the same people, guess what you're going to do? You're going to duplicate what you had before. You may think you'll go into the situation with a fresh perspective. I mean, it is a fresh perspective because now you have a breakup in your history, but the core of who you are and everything you've learned and your experience and your triggers especially are still there and if they're still there then the cycle repeats 
This is why I hear from people that say, I broke up with my boyfriend 10 times. <laughs> because every time you go back, you have the same triggers. You haven't done any healing. You just wanted to get back together. Maybe both of you wanted to get back together. But you have the same triggers, which means you haven't done the healing. You haven't done the growing and the learning and evolving that you need to do in order to reach a new level in yourself. Because there's a place that both of you need to get to. And that place is uh, a place of honoring your boundaries, knowing your values, and being confident enough and courageous enough to go, wait, you're crossing my line. This isn't right. I was just talking about this in another segment. It's, this is not right. This is a boundary. You cannot cross this boundary. This won't work if you choose to cross this boundary. Or this won't work if you continue getting triggered by X. Or if you continue talking to me in that way like you did before, this is what caused me to leave in the first place. If you continue talking to me in this way, I won't have it. I will leave. This is where you set up parameters. So if you do get back together, you have these parameters and then you create accountability for the other person. If you cross this line, I'm out of here or there's going to be a problem. So you set up these parameters so that there is no problem. However, you're usually not ready to set up parameters because it's more of a wishful thinking type of thing. Like I remember um, finally getting over most of my judgment issues after my wife and I separated. We were still talking. We still wanted the marriage to work. And she saw this new person coming out and she was like, what? How do I respond to you if you're not judging me? I mean, it was terrible that I was doing it all those years. But for her to see this new me, uh, she saw that I was going through these changes. So I was very happy that I felt these changes inside myself. But every now and then a small trigger would come up and um, I wouldn't show it to her, but I would feel it inside. And it's probably fortunate that we uh, got a divorce when we did because even though I was over most of my judgment, uh, I wasn't over all of it. Plus, there was some other stuff that came up as I was healing from my judgment issues because I was highly judgmental in my marriage. I don't know if you've ever heard me talk about that, but... I used to judge my wife for uh, quite a lot of things, but especially you know, how much food she put in her mouth, what food she put in her mouth. It was a big issue for me. And I had to get over that because that was a major trigger inside of me. So when she left, I started healing from that. Having her out of the house helped me understand myself more, helped me have thoughts that were mine that were not influenced by anyone else. And then I had to deal with those thoughts. And I had to go, whoa, I have these triggers. I have these judgments. And I came to the conclusion that if I have a problem, I need to take care of me. I can't change someone else. That's when I started healing from judgment and uh, stopping being so judgmental toward her and toward other people. And so my point is, we were separated, yet I still had triggers in me. I, I went through some healing, but I still had these triggers. And when she wanted a divorce uh, several months later, uh, it was painful. I didn't want it. I knew I had changed, but I still didn't know enough. I still didn't know me well enough to know that I had really changed, that I'd really healed until she was completely gone and there was no option to get her back whatsoever. Because that's what happens. When you believe there's an option to get someone back, you're not fully engaged in you, in yourself, in your own healing. Because there's still the option to get happiness from outside of you. To find um, comfort outside of you. To find peace outside of you. So you seek it in someone else. If they just come back into my life, I'll be happy again. When you seek that from someone else, that's when it's a little dangerous because that means that you're trying to find someone else to complete you, to fulfill you, to make up for what you don't have in yourself. And when you find someone to make up for what you don't already have in yourself, that can create dysfunction. Often it does create dysfunction. Like I don't have happiness. When you're in my life, you bring me happiness. Therefore, you always have to be in my life no matter what. 
And then when you leave, I'll be unhappy. And that puts a lot of pressure on the other person and they're not sure what to do with it. They feel smothered. They feel like you're too needy. They want to get away. And so there you separate and now you're unhappy and you want them back so bad and you'll do anything to get them back except let them go, which means you may not do anything to get them back because letting them go means they may not come back. So it's important to let them go so you get to know yourself better. So you get to heal because while there's still an attachment in your mind, they also become a crutch and you can't fully heal if you have desires to get them back, if you have a desire to contact them. Or in the case of this person who wrote the letter, uh, he wants to just apologize for how the conversation went and maybe talk about uh, missing their friendship. And my personal opinion is it's too soon if you still feel the way you felt the day after, the week after, the month after you broke up where you still have this draw, this pull toward them, that they somehow complete you, they somehow fulfill you, they give you what you don't have as far as uh, overall overarching emotions like comfort, peace, security, happiness, satisfaction. I'm not saying that people shouldn't bring that kind of stuff into your life, but you have to have a certain level of it before you go into a relationship if you want a functional, happy, healthy, uh, nurturing environment to keep that relationship going, to keep it growing, to keep it so that you can continue to bond closer and closer together. Our reliance on our partner to fulfill us in ways that we aren't already fulfilled can be quite the um, codependent relationship. There's an enabler, there's a taker, there's a giver, and it um, doesn't always work out. So that's why I think it's important that uh, if you still have this feeling after a breakup, and you have a somewhat uh, covert agenda that if you contact them and just say, I'm sorry, but uh, a, a little background hope that they'll say, oh, I miss you so much. Let's get back together. Then you're probably not ready to contact them because now you're trying to fool yourself. Now you're trying to say, well, if they just heard my voice, maybe they'll come back to me, which means your true agenda is just to get them back. I know it's probably exactly what you want, but that means you're not in a new space inside yourself and that if you did get that person back, you'd be in the same dysfunctional state that caused you to break up in the first place. There's a whole lot more we can talk about there, but why don't we just leave it at that so that you have something to um, really absorb. I mean, you may already know this, but if you don't, then... I'm just going to ask you to keep an open mind and step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, without a doubt, you are amazing. Amazing.